Hey nature lovers, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kayla and I'm all about house plants, native plants, and medicinal plants. Today we're going to be talking about flowering plants, specifically the aeroid family or Araceae. There's a ton of buzz around this family in the houseplant industry. These include Spathophyllum, Peace Lilies, uh, Anthuriums, and other plants that we're familiar with but we don't often associate them with their flowers. And then later I'd like to mention any native or medicinal plants in this family because uh, I got so excited when I realized a plant that I see a ton here in Michigan in the springtime is actually a part of the aeroid family. So let's get to it. First of all, I'd like to thank my first 100 subscribers. It's so exciting to reach that milestone and that goal. Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys. I'm not gonna get into the basic structures inside of a flower, um, meaning like the male and female parts, for instance. I'd more so like to try and talk about the shape of the inflorescence that characterizes a plant as an aeroid. So when I say inflorescence, I mean flowering structure, basically. So there are two identifying characteristics that consist of, um, that are structures that make up the inflorescence on an aeroid. And that is the spathe and the spadix. Now the spathe is the hood. Um, it's a modified leaf and is there to help protect the spadix. Now the spadix is where things get complicated. The spadix is made of tons of little flowers that are Hard to see with the naked eye. I mean, you can see them change color as the bloom ages, but you can't really tell that they look, you know, like they don't look like flowers, but they, they are. And depending on the species, um, they are either perfect flowers, meaning they have both ma male and female parts, or they have imperfect flowers, and that means they have separate male flowers from female flowers, but they're in different parts of the spike. So the male flowers are usually on the upper, more exposed portion of the, the spike, the spadix. And while the female flowers are underneath the spathe, or protected by the spathe, more on that in a second. We can cover flower structure and the process of pollination in another video if you're interested. Since you don't know me yet, um, at this point in my YouTube adventure, I'll let you know that I am an advocate for gardening for pollinators. And I've got a couple of videos of uh, native plant seeds that I'm growing this year and pollinators I'd be expecting to see. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at how these plants are generally pollinated. So firstly, plants use pheromones um, or a scent that attracts certain pollinators to the flower. And in this family, some famously smell like carrion, which smells like rotting meat. Uh, it's most powerful during peak bloom time, and then it fades as the inflorescence ages. Also, some species are known to use heat to accentuate, accentuate the pheromone and then supply a warm sanctuary for its pollinators. We'll get to that in a second as well. Beetles and flies are the predominant pollinators for this family. Some beetles are host-specific, meaning they stick to one species of plant to spend some portion of its life cycle on. For example, certain philodendrons. Beetles will use the lower portion of the inflorescence where the female flowers are as a shelter while they mate and feed on the lipids that the plant excretes. Other generalist beetles, um, generalist beetles meaning they don't mind what plants they visit, they pollinate familiar plants like Diffenbachia, Syngonium, and Hamelomena. Flies really like those carrion-smelling plants, and they're often attracted to anthuriums, which are also visited by beetles and weevils. Once the plants are pollinated, they produce berries with seeds in them, and other animals rely on these berries as food sources. Um, which then helps the seeds spread to other locations. There they poop them out. <laughs> this next portion is about aeroid plants native to eastern North America. So my education about native plants has been more gradual and slower than it has been about house plants. So I was aware of the aeroid family first. 
One time when I was walking around the paths at the Botanical Gardens in Ann Arbor, I noticed a familiar flower structure off the side of the path. Turns out it was eastern skunk cabbage, Simplicarpus phytitis. It's a member of the aeroid family, but it's native from Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia to Minnesota, and then south to North Carolina and Tennessee. Hey, Leela. And we'll get to a couple other interesting things when I touch on medicinal plants in the aeroid family. And the second native aeroid plant that I am familiar with is called Jack in the Pulpit, Aricima trophyllum. Can you tell the family resemblance? <laughs> it's also native from Nova Scotia to Minnesota, but all the way down to Texas and even Florida. And now we'll cover a few medicinal and edible aeroids. But before we do, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an herbalist, so I would recommend consulting with your doctor first before considering using anything we're going to be talking about. This info is more out of curiosity and reflection about our relationship with plants. So as a reminder, this family is known to have calcium oxalate in it, which is extremely irritating if eaten raw. First is Aglionema commutatum trubii. It's an anti-diabetic, anti-mystatic, antiviral, immunomodulary, which means it modifies the immune system. Then there is Rifidophora decursiva. It's anti-malarial alkaloid, antibiotic, and used for muscle pain. Homolomina um, aromatica. It's anti-inflammatory, and it's used at, in India as a treatment for certain skin diseases. And here in Eastern North America, there's Jack in the Pulpit, which is a stimulant diaphoretic, which means it induces perspiration, expectorant, it treats cough, antiseptic, root poultice are used for headaches and skin diseases, and then ointments are used for ringworm, tetherworm, and abscesses, but don't eat it raw. And then skunk cabbage, which we also just talked about, it was used by the Native Americans for its expectorant and antiseptic properties to treat bronchitis and asthma conditions. The leaves can cause blisters, and excessive doses of the root can cause nausea and vomiting, etc. It's antispasmodic, diaphoretic, uh, again, diuretic, which means it induces urination, emetic, causes vomiting, and expectorant and slightly narcotic. There was a lot there. <laughs> and then lastly, edible plants. In the tropical regions where these plants are native to, Alocasia mycorrhizos, Amorphophallus pionofolius, very interesting flower there, Calocasia esculenta, and Xanthosoma sagittifolium are prepared with their corms for carbohydrates. In Eastern North America, Native Americans have been known to use Jack in the Pulpit that also has as a corm, and it's also prepared by roasting and drying it for its carbohydrates as well, kind of like potatoes. And I guess there's actually recipes out there for cookies and potato chips using Jack in the Pulpit corms for this plant. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Let me know in the comments down below if you're not from Eastern North America, what native plants or medicinal plants in the arid family that you have in your area, or if you are from the area, if I'm missing any awesome, beautiful aeroid plants, let me know, or just geek out about the cool aeroid family. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and have a good one.